followed by 13 and 14. God's word. When a land transgresses, it has many rulers, but with a man of understanding and knowledge, its stability will long continue. Verse 13, whoever conceals his transgressions will not prosper, but he who confesses and forsakes them will obtain mercy. Verse 14, blessed is the one who fears the Lord always, but whoever hardens his heart will fall into calamity. Lord, we thank you for your word. And now, Father, may the words of my mouth and the meditations that are on all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. We can be seated, please. When we read in literature, whether it be a favorite fairy tale that you might have, and usually we all have uh, one that we really enjoy, or if we're reading in God's Word, the Bible itself, we will often come across phrases that read like this, the land is wicked, or it is the wicked country, as it says in Malachi 1, verse 4, or perhaps we're with friends or we're out, or we're talking with family, or we're at the dinner table, and someone says, it is a wicked world. Who's heard that this week? It's a wicked world. Well, when we hear these statements, what, what do we mean? What, what do we understand that they are conveying? We should not take such statements to mean that there is something inherently evil or sinful about the physical characteristics of the land or the place itself. Though the soil of a land may not be particularly rich, it is not evil. Though the water of a land or a place may not be particularly good for drinking, it does not, the water does not commit sin. Nor do the trees and grasses and rocks of a land harbor sinful designs against their creator. What we do mean when we say a wicked land or the wicked country or it is a wicked world is that the people who inhabit the physical confines of that land are evil. They do commit sin, and these image bearers of God do harbor in their hearts sinful designs against others and against their creator who is God. In expressions like these, then, we are stating that the conditions of the land become synonymous with the actions of its people who live there. If the people are on the whole righteous, the land is righteous. If the people are on the whole evil, the land is evil. Or as verse 2 of Proverbs 28 reads, the land transgresses. Christians are often among the first to point out that we live in a wicked world, and we are not wrong. In an age of information, probably too much information, I'm sure we could all agree, we are bombarded with all kinds of heinous evidence that show that the land in which we live is wicked indeed. So, the big question for today, how are Christians to be righteous in a land that is overcome by the wickedness of its inhabitants? That is the question that Proverbs 28, particularly verse 2, forces us to ask, and the question I would like to explore with you today. How are Christians to be righteous in a land that is overcome by the wickedness of its inhabitants? The book of Judges in the Old Testament is really exhibit A for this kind of exploration. If there was ever a time in history where those with saving faith in God were tried, were tested in a wicked land, it was the time of the Judges. Judges chapter 3 verse 7, for example, says, 
And the people of Israel did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. Five verses later in verse 12, it reads, And the people of Israel again did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. And these verses repeat themselves like a mantra all the way through Judges 2, 11, all the way to Judges 13, 1. Adding to the misery of those verses, we read beginning in Judges 17, verse 6, the following. In those days, there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. We see a similar refrain in Judges 18, verse 1, and Judges 19, verse 1, both emphasizing the absence of a king in the land. And in Judges 21, 25, the very last verse of the entire book, just for good measure, we read the closing. In those days, there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. I think Judges is trying to tell us something here. When we take these two refrains, so on the one hand, the people of Israel again did what was evil in the sight of the Lord, and we couple it with, in those days, there was no king in Israel, everyone did what was right in his own eyes, and we marry them together, we have the essence of what verse 2 in our text says today. And that verse begins in the first part with, when a land transgresses, it has many rulers. That is exactly what we find in Judges. Over a roughly 350-year period, God would raise up more than 10 judges to deliver his people Israel, the land Israel, from a terrible cycle. Step one in the cycle, the people abandon the Lord, preferring the false gods of the nations around them and worshiping them. Step two, the Lord then gives the people and the land over to their sins, empowering pagan rulers to subject the land, subject the people. Step three, the people cry out for relief, admitting before God their transgressions. Step four, the Lord rescues the land, condescending himself to the pleas and cries of his wayward and sinful people only for the whole thing to start again. Back to step one, the people abandon the Lord, preferring themselves, preferring their sins to his love and his faithfulness. What I find so fascinating about verse two of Proverbs 28 today is that it indicates a cause-effect relationship. The cause is stated as when a land transgresses, that is the cause. And the effect is stated as it has many rulers. This indicates that it is the sinfulness of the people that produces the multitude of foreign rulers and even the judges who rule in the land. And that is, of course, the very outcome we see in the book of Judges. On the whole, and this is quite something, on the whole, even the judges of Israel that God raises up to deliver his people, even they embody the same fallenness of the land and its people. The commentary in the ESV study Bible notes, in general, the book of Judges does not describe the judges as leading Israel in true repentance and in putting away foreign gods. And that's quite an indictment, for God had raised them up for such a purpose. The result is that we get a land, a people, that are caught in this vicious washing machine cycle. The people sin, the culture is overwhelmingly sinful, the leaders emerging from this cesspool, if you will, are seriously flawed, and sin begets more sin. We see this everywhere in our world today. And we are led individually as Christians to cry out, as we did in our prayer of confession today from Romans 7.24, 
We see all of this in the land, and we cry out, wretched man that I am, who will save me from this body of death? In other words, will my sin ever stop, Lord? Will the sins of my people ever stop? Will I always dwell in a land that is full of sin and wayward? Is there any hope that the land will cease being wicked? And really, it is not unlike the epiphany the prophet Isaiah realizes upon his vision of God sitting on his throne as recorded in Isaiah 6. Isaiah cries something very similar to what Paul cries in Romans 7, 24. Here's what Isaiah says in Isaiah 6, 5. Woe is me, for I am lost, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. Isaiah understood the connection between his personal sin, his people's sin, and the land that they inhabited. In both Paul's cry in Romans and Isaiah's cry in the book of Isaiah, we begin to understand the dilemma of our earlier question. How are Christians to be righteous in a land that is overcome by the wickedness of its inhabitants? For we ourselves, as we consider our lives as we did in our call to confession today, we ourselves are naturally unrighteous people. Like the land of Israel, we see in God's people the church today, we see in ourselves the same kinds of idolatry, the same kinds of lusts, the same kinds of spiritual blindness, the same kind of pride that plagued the land of Israel. So, how can righteousness prevail when a land transgresses. It seems impossible. In the novel, The Road, a similar problem that we are working through is highlighted. It is a post-apocalyptic work of fiction about a father and his son who must survive in a land, or I should say a world, of complete depravity following an ecological disaster. As the story unfolds, the man and his son encounter just about every kind of human depravity we can imagine. Whereas the father is undone and hardened by the sin he encounters around him, the son embraces empathy towards others, exemplifying goodness in a land of transgression, in a world of darkness. But praise be to God that reality is greater than fiction. And the gospel is our answer when things seem impossible. When living in a land of transgression seems impossible, think of Luke 1, verse 37. For nothing will be impossible with God. And like a beam of light shooting through the darkest and most sinister cloud, the gospel shines forth upon our land. And in the latter part of verse 2 of our text today, we find the answer to the cycle of sin and hopelessness. Sin and hopelessness. Sin and hopelessness. It says there in our text, but with a man of understanding and knowledge, its, that is the land, the people, its stability will long continue. It is another cause-effect relationship, but unlike the first part of verse 2, which shows that the overwhelming sinfulness of the people was the cause that produced flawed and ruined leaders, the latter part of verse 2 extends the possibility that with a man of understanding, with a man of knowledge, stability may long continue. It gives us hope. 
We love stability, don't we? We cherish it. We do not like to be unstable. Those who have or, or do experience vertigo in our church know this better than most. Without stability, progress cannot be made. Things just continue to spin and descend into chaos. Nothing can be done. But with a man of understanding and knowledge, stability can flourish, vanquishing that sinful maelstrom, that sinful cycle that we see in Judges, for example. We need such a man. We need such a king who breaks in from outside the sinful cycle of a land and its people. After the chaos in the time of Israel's judges came the reforming kings. On the heels of the great prophet Samuel came King David. You may have heard of him. David's son came next, King Solomon. And later on from David's line, two more excellent kings of Judah emerged in Josiah and Hezekiah. And as we consider the prescription in Proverbs 28, verse 2, the prescription for a man of understanding and knowledge, I want to read to you about King Hezekiah in particular. He's one of my favorite kings. Here's what it says in 2 Kings chapter 18, verse 3, through the first part of verse 7. Hezekiah did what was right in the eyes of the Lord, according to all that David his father had done. He removed the high places and broke the pillars and cut down the Asherah. And he broke in pieces the bronze serpent that Moses had made, for until those days the people of Israel had made offerings to it. It was called Nehushtan. Hezekiah trusted in the Lord, the God of Israel, so that there was none like him among all the kings after him, nor among those who were before him. For he held fast to the Lord. He did not depart from following him, but kept the commandments that the Lord commanded Moses. And the Lord was with him. Wherever he went out, he prospered. Hezekiah, as you can read here, was the quintessential king, the best. And as far as men go, he was a great one. And you can see in those verses how Hezekiah broke through the cycle of sinfulness in the land. A king had come. But even the best of men are men at best. The judges were not the answer as we have seen. And though several kings like Hezekiah were excellent, they too were flawed. Ultimately, they too were a product of the same sinfulness that stained the land and upon each of their deaths, they left the land to fall back into sin and transgression. Though they brought with them a certain degree of understanding, as Proverbs 2 said, a certain degree of knowledge, even producing stability that long continued, as verse 2 says, the stability ultimately never lasted forever. We need a better man, one who is better than a judge and better than a king. Our land, our world today, and its people need a greater king than this world can bring forth. And that man and that king is Jesus Christ, and it is him alone. He is the true man of understanding and knowledge. He is the true man who provides stability in the world that will not only long continue, but will continue forever, for all eternity. Jesus is the man who gives his people great hope that we can persevere against our own sins, even while living in a land of transgression. As the Apostle Paul says in Philippians 4.13, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. 
Our question again, how are Christians to be righteous in a land that is overcome by the wickedness of its inhabitants? Here, 2 Corinthians 5.21. For our sake, God made Christ to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. 1 Peter 2.24 proclaims of Christ, He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree, that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed. You see, it is all of Christ who bore our sins on the cross that we might bear his righteousness. In a land of transgression, the church, the people, wear the righteousness of Christ as if we had never sinned at all. Isn't that something? It is truly good news and our only hope. Turning to the last verses in our text today, 13 and 14, these verses really serve to show us the way. And in these verses we find both warnings and promises that I want to leave you with as we conclude. And these verses are interesting because they are, they form a chiasm where the verses interact with each other to reinforce the concepts, in this case, the warnings and the promises. And so in the first part of verse 13, we'll call that 13a, and then the second part of verse 14, we'll call that 14b, the warning is reinforced. Let's start with 13a. Hear what God's word tells us from the proverb. The first part of 13 tells us that whoever conceals his transgressions will not prosper. And now, if you go to the second part of 14, 14b, you'll see that the verse strengthens what we just read. It says, not only will they not prosper, but whoever hardens his heart will fall into calamity. And when you think about it, calamity is a lot worse than simply not prospering. That is the warning. Hear now the promise that is yours or can be yours in Jesus Christ. The second part of verse 13, 13b states, but he who confesses and forsakes his transgressions will obtain mercy. And verse, the first part of 14, 14a, strengthens the promise. Blessed is the one who fears the Lord always. Which two sets of verses will find you and I in the proverb today? Will we be those who wallow in a land of transgression, concealing our sins, and hardening our hearts against the true man, Christ the King? Or will we be those in a land of transgression who confess and forsake our sins to obtain mercy out of a good fear, out of a good reverence for the Lord Almighty? May you be righteous in a wicked land, in and through the King, Jesus Christ. Will you pray with me now? Lord, we marvel at your word. We marvel that even in these wisdom sayings of Proverbs, that to us sometimes can seem scattered, to us sometimes can seem to lack unity, that we can see Christ and we can see our need for him. We thank you, Lord, even for these promises that are ours as we examine the central part of this proverb today. Oh, Lord, by your might, O King, will you engender in all of us a deep repentance, whether it be for the hundred thousandth time of repenting of our sins, which is good and necessary, Or if it is for the first time that we find ourselves in Christ by faith, 
O Lord, engender in each of us a repentance that runs deep, a repentance that is full even in a land of transgression. O Lord, we pray this in your name. Amen.